Greetings, and thank you for visiting Podcast Stories. Regarding the ability to properly express the insidiousness that affects the mind that is entrapped at the beginning of the process, the definition of suspicion that is found in the Webster Dictionary is somewhat insufficient. A more accurate analogy would be to compare suspicion to a small worm that burrows its way into the mind and makes its home there. It is possible for it to remain dormant for a period of weeks or months, but it does not die, rather, it quietly hibernates in the regions of the mind, waiting to be nourished with additional uncertainty. On the dark side of the psyche comes the notion of suspicion. When there is a degree of distrust present, there is neither joy nor contentment. It has the power to render its victim incapable of taking any action or to induce a condition of numbness, which will prevent them from being able to reason in an appropriate manner. Why do I find myself thinking about the word suspicion so much? The straightforward response is that the occurrence of all the catastrophic events that have occurred over the course of the past three months began with a minor unexpected observation that planted the seed of mistrust in my mind. Prior to the occurrence of that event, I would have never experienced even the tiniest uncertainty over the faithfulness of my wife of 16 years. It is the case that I am awake before my wife and the children on five days out of the week. My pattern consists of sneaking out of bed and making a stealthy entrance into the training area, which is situated in the basement. I have developed this regimen. While the rest of the family is asleep upstairs, I am able to work out without being disturbed for at least half an hour thanks to the fact that I have many contemporary exercise machines at my disposal. I am able to wake up my entire body by performing a vigorous workout on the bench, the flex machine, and the treadmill. It was a Thursday morning when I had a slightly earlier wake-up time than I normally would have. I decided to get out of bed and go to the workout room rather than continue to stretch out in bed for another 15 minutes. After completing my workout earlier than expected, I went back upstairs to take a shower and get ready for work for the day. I could not find Kathy in bed. As I entered the bedroom, I quickly opened the door to the bathroom and stepped inside. I did this as I was walking into the bedroom. Just as she was going to put on her bra, Kathy was standing there. I gave her a friendly grin, and then my eyes got sight of a peculiar mark that was dark black and blue in color and was located on Kathy's left breast. The mark was approximately the size of a half dollar and stood in an oval shape. The dark mark caused my eyes to dart upward, and they immediately focused on Kathy's expression of surprise. Kathy's eyes suddenly took on a look that I had never seen before, and it happened in the span of around 20 milliseconds. Her mind registered the idea that I had just seen the dark mark on her breast, and those eyes flashed a deep sense of remorse as she perceived the situation. In a sense, it seemed as if I had caught her engaging in some kind of illegal activity. As soon as she turned her body away from me and began to put on her bra, the look of guilt that she had been wearing instantly transformed into a look of shame. Within that extremely brief but uncomfortable moment, there was not a single word spoken. As Kathy walked out of the restroom, she smiled as she passed me on her way out. The circumstance that occurred during that extremely brief interaction left me speechless as I stood there, unable to make sense of what had just taken place. When I saw the dark mark on Kathy's breast, my mind refused to let go of the image. There was no doubt that it appeared to be a love bite, a hickey that was brought on by intensive sucking on a single area of flesh. What exactly was it, then? Where did it come from? What caused Kathy to obtain the black and blue mark on her body? Did she hurt herself in some way? The other possible explanation for the origin of her bruise was not something that my mind was willing to accept. As I stood in the shower, the warm water spread across my body and washed over me. Despite my best efforts, I was unable to erase the event from my memory. My best effort was to relegate it to the back of my mind as I started to think about the workday that was waiting for me at the breakfast table. I was able to do this to the best of my ability. As she ran around getting me and the kids ready for the new day, Kathy was her usual, happy self. She was all smiles and laughter. During the time that they were finishing their breakfast and making their way out the door to catch the school bus, Jason and Christy engaged in their typical sibling behavior of picking at each other. I saw you looking at the bruise mark on my breast in the bathroom, Kathy remarked as she eventually sat down across from me at the table. It was at that time that I noticed you looking at it. I injured myself yesterday at work. There was an open file drawer I bumped into and hit my breast against it. It was really dumb of me and it left a small black and blue mark. In a manner that seemed to indicate that she had nothing else to say about the bruise, she shrugged her shoulders and maintained a calm and carefree expression on her face. With the exception of the brief expression of remorse that appeared in Kathy's eyes when I first saw the bruise, 
I would not have given the topic any further consideration under normal circumstances. The expression that her explanation was unable to satisfy in my thoughts was the one that I remember. After finishing my toast, I simply nodded my head and continued eating. As I made my way out of the kitchen and into the garage, we gave each other the regular hug and kiss that we do. After I had departed, Kathy would leave for work approximately 15 to 20 minutes later. Regarding the meeting with the client that was planned to take place this morning, I had a lot of thoughts going through my head. Kathy's explanation and the restroom incident completely slipped my mind as I went to work. I had forgotten about both of them. On the other hand, I was completely unaware that the worm of doubt had been put in my head. Simply burying itself inside and going to sleep was all that it did. Together with my stunning wife, Kathy, who is 39 years old, I lead what many people would consider to be the ideal American lifestyle. The suburbia in which we reside is a pleasant one, and it is of the upper middle class. Despite the fact that we both have professional occupations and have graduated from college, we are able to maintain a healthy balance between our two children and our careers. He is 13 years old, and Jason is our oldest child. If you were to compare him to the Duracell bunny, he would be a bundle of energy. Middle school, music classes, swimming, soccer practice, and soccer games are all things that keep him quite active. He also plays soccer frequently. Christy is our daughter, and she is 11 years old. She is the tiny princess from her father's side. As is the case in the majority of other father-daughter relationships, she had already mastered the feminine talents that allow her to bend and wrap me around her little finger even when she was still in her early years. In spite of the fact that I am aware that I am being influenced, I am unable to defend myself when she shows off her charming qualities. I introduce myself as Paul Matthews. My age difference with my wife is one year. Over the course of the previous 12 years, I have been working for Equity Corporation. My current role is that of section manager, and part of my responsibilities include overseeing the maintenance department that is located in the headquarters of the company. Within my department, there are 24 individuals who are responsible for maintenance tasks that range from the installation of computer and telephone systems to the maintenance of heating and air conditioning equipment. I don't find that my job is particularly stressful. The people that work for me are exceptionally talented, and they are more knowledgeable about their jobs than I am. Sometimes I have to travel for work, although it's not very often. Approximately once or twice a year, I go to a conference or lecture that focuses on the latest advancements in building maintenance. On a few of these business excursions that took place outside of the city, Kathy has accompanied me. At our region's local television cable firm, Kathy serves as the director of human relations with the corporation. Kathy has a highly positive self-image as a result of the high amount of responsibility she enjoys in her career. The fact that she has a job has also been a tremendous boon to her sense of self-worth. Kathy believed that her professional life would come to an end after the birth of our baby, and that she would be relegated to the role of a stay-at-home mom and a Susie homemaker. By the time Christy was three years old, it was evident that Kathy would need to engage in some activity outside, which would present her with a greater challenge than cleaning up after toddlers and preparing meals. Kathy's feelings of guilt and depression first caused her to be torn apart. Despite the fact that she was depressed by the fact that all of her college education was evaporating without ever being fully utilized, she felt bad that she was unable to deal with the demands of being a full-time mother. Kathy's sister Evelyn moved into the same area, which brought about a change in all of those circumstances. Evelyn and Kathy were very different from one another. Evelyn Hunter was the epitome of a mother and a homemaker. She had no desire to challenge the world with her business acumen or to be some eye candy at a receptionist's desk. She was the perfect mother and homemaker. In Evelyn's perspective, the way life was intended to be was for her husband, Todd, to be the primary breadwinner. She found that motherhood was a perfect fit for her. The Hunter family consists of three children, a son and two daughters. When it came to his siblings, Alan was the oldest, followed by his twin sisters, Alexis and Alyssa. The adoption of our two children by their Aunt Evelyn and the fact that they spent a significant amount of their free time at the residence of their cousins occurred in a relatively short period of time. This was a wonderful opportunity for Kathy. Kathy was able to start pursuing a professional career because to the arrangement that she and Evelyn came up with, which also granted her sister the responsibility of being the den mother. That occurred eight years ago. With CableNet, the local television cable business, Kathy was able to secure the right position for her. 
Her position as human relations manager, which she reports to the regional managing director, was offered to her recently. In terms of a job, Kathy was able to achieve everything she had dreamed for. She felt a sense of success as a result of it, and at the same time, time moved toward her. It is she. There is some liberty away from the workplace. She was responsible for conducting interviews with prospective subcontractors for Cable Nex, which was one of her primary job responsibilities. She was responsible for ensuring that all of the state and federal recruiting rules were adhered to by any subcontractor that Cable recruited for employment. When I was analyzing the proposal specs for a new telephone exchange system for the corporate headquarters, it was many weeks after the incident that occurred in the toilet with Kathy's damaged breast. Upon further inspection, I found that the draft plan had neglected to include a number of essential components. The two employees who were directly responsible for putting up the specs were the ones I assigned the task to. Despite the fact that it was not typical for these two workers to make a mistake, I gave them a thorough reprimand and then sent them off to make the necessary corrections to the draft. My already strained nerves had been much more ruffled as a result of this encounter. If it weren't for the fact that I discovered the mistake in the draft, the entire order would have been damaged to a significant degree. I came to the conclusion that it was necessary for me to leave the office for the remainder of the day and indulge in some stress-relieving physical activity at the gym. As I was leaving the office, I informed my secretary that I would be absent for the remainder of the day and that she should only contact me in the event that the company experienced a catastrophe similar to the one described in the 911 call. I was greeted with a smile, and she simply nodded her head. The following two hours were spent at the gym, where I engaged in a strenuous workout that included swimming 100 laps in the enormous pool, spending several minutes in the steam room, and taking a good hot shower, which made me feel like a completely different person. When I left the gym, it was 2.10 in the afternoon. I had just finished my workout. There was a brief moment when I entertained the idea of going back to the office. That concept was swiftly snuffed out by my newly rejuvenated thinking. Allow the group to handle its own affairs for the remainder of the day. I had a negative notion that came to my head while I was driving home the other day. There were tales that I had read and heard about men who unexpectedly returned home to discover their wife in the bedroom with a lover. Kathy will never be unfaithful to me, I thought to myself as I grinned at that thought. Then, the little worm of suspicion that was living inside of my mind began to wiggle its ugly head, and the thought of the guilty expression that was appearing in Kathy's eyes caused me to feel a twinge of uncertainty. I parked my car in the driveway for a fraction of a whole second. The driveway is clear of any unusual vehicles. When the garage door was raised, there were no vehicles in the garage either. There were still children who were attending school, and Kathy was going to be at work for another three hours straight. I have complete and utter solitude for myself. After quickly changing into some sweatpants and a shirt, I went into the den and put on some smooth jazz as I entered the house that was completely silent. The phone started to ring just as I was about to get into my recliner and take a break from my day. As I stood up to answer the phone, I thought to myself, damn it anyway, and I affirmed my decision. It better not be the office calling. I said, hello, as I took up the phone and answered it. Is this the Matthews residence? On the other end, there was a female voice that spoke. In the beginning, my thoughts immediately went to the thought that this was a telemarketing making one of those obnoxious calls to encourage sales. I disputed the person who was calling me, and I sounded annoyed as I said, yes, it is. Who is this calling? The woman's voice sounded quite sad as she said, oh, I'm sorry to have bothered you. I was wanting to talk to Kathy Matthews, and she expressed her sense of regret. She's still at work. Can I take a message for her? This interruption was something I wanted to put a stop to so that I could return to my alone and my glass of Jack Daniels. Are you willing to be so kind? Hey, my name is Nancy Cobb. One of my goals was to give her a call and let her know how much it would cost to get my car fixed. My mind was racing for a little moment. Regarding a Nancy Cobb, Kathy did not disclose anything to me at any point. Nancy, are you able to provide me with the information? My interest had reached its pinnacle, and as a result, my tone of voice had taken on a more pleasant quality. Yes, tell Kathy that the body repair shop said the cost would not exceed $550 for the tail light and dent in the fender, Nancy's voice sounded like that of a woman in her middle years. I asked Nancy in a careless tone, all right, Nancy. Tell me more about the accident and what happened, with the expectation that she would provide me with all of the detailed information. Well, it was last week, Tuesday when Kathy backed into my car in the parking lot. 
She didn't do any damage to her car, but the edge of her bumper smashed the tail light lens and made a small dent in the fender. It wasn't very bad, so Kathy told me to get an estimate, and she would pay the cost of repair. She didn't want to report it to the insurance company. When I heard her say, I can understand why she wouldn't want to do that. Those insurance companies will raise your premiums at the slightest chance, it sounded to me like two ladies solving all of the issues in the world in a parking lot. I jotted a note for Kathy as I was talking to Nancy. So, I imagine they have these kinds of accidents all the time in the mall parking lot, I added. A moment before I was going to conclude our talk, Nancy replied, Yes, I imagine that accidents in the parking lots of shopping malls happen all the time. However, this particular accident took place in the parking lot of the Pine Tree Motel. Wham, my head exploded in response to the final statement. I made an effort to make my voice sound natural and to avoid conveying the tightness that was clutching my chest. So, Kathy was at the motel a week ago on Tuesday, and she backed her car into your car, is that correct, Nancy? I asked. Yes, that's correct. I had gone over to see my sister who was staying at the motel. My husband does not like my sister at all, so I have to meet her at the motel whenever she comes to town. I was getting out of my car when Kathy backed out of her parking space. She must not have seen my car behind her when she bumped into it. It was a good thing she wasn't going very fast, or the damage would have been greater. There was too much confusion in my head, so I just asked Nancy, is there anything else about the accident you can remember, Nancy? I gave some thought to what question I should ask her next, but ultimately, I decided to just ask her. Well, nothing other than to thank the man who came over to look at the damage and tell me that my car was still very drivable. But he said I should get it fixed before the police gave me a ticket for driving with a broken tail light. When I asked her, was Kathy upset by the accident? I could hear her take a long breath as she spent a moment thinking over the question. Yes, she was. That was until the kind gentleman came over to assess the damage. He was so helpful about the incident that he calmed us both down. My question was, did the man work for the motel? No, I don't think so. In fact, I think Kathy knew him, although she didn't say that she knew him. I wanted to ask her what this kind gentleman looked like, but Nancy could have been suspicious of her presence if she had asked me that question. It's possible that she believes she provided me with more information than she ought to have. Well, thank you, Nancy. When Kathy gets back to her house, I will provide her with this information. Are you able to provide her with your phone number? When she handed me her business card, I replied by giving her my phone number. In the event that she misplaced your phone number, she wrote it down on the back of her card after I asked her for her home number. I also asked her for her phone number. Would you be able to offer it to me once more, Nancy? Both her home phone number and her mobile phone number were provided to me by her. I am grateful to you, Nancy. I will promptly provide Kathy with this information as soon as she arrives at her residence this evening. After saying our goodbyes, we hung up the phone. As I leaned back in the chair, I turned my gaze upwards toward the ceiling. My ideas were going back and forth in my head at the same time. To what end? What was the point of all of this? As far as I was aware, Kathy had not revealed anything to me about a car accident. That is something that she would have undoubtedly shared with me as soon as she laid eyes on me. Kathy's presence at the Pine Tree Motel on a Tuesday afternoon is also odd. Why would she be there? There is a possibility that the answer is as straightforward as her conducting an interview with a new subcontractor. Considering that she was at the motel in the afternoon, there was no reason for the restaurant there to be keeping anything secret about her presence. In an effort to make sense of the most recent piece of unpleasant information that had just come to my knowledge, I was trying to rationalize it. The fact that she was staying at that motel may be explained by a hundred different different responses that are completely innocuous. In spite of this, the worm of mistrust began to stir once more in the recesses of my mind. Perhaps it is the worst answer that could ever be given. It's possible that Kathy has a lover. You could never know for sure, how could you? My tensions were finally calmed down by drinking two more Jack Daniels. At that point, the children have already rushed in from school. Hello, Dad, they said as they always do, and then they went upstairs to their own rooms. Christy did not arrive until almost half an hour later, at which point she entered the kitchen to begin preparing the supper that Kathy had prepared before she left for work. Kathy had just entered the house when I heard the garage door open. I was still sitting in the recliner, attempting to rest when I heard the door open. As she approached me, she planted a passionate kiss on the crown of my head. The phrase you're home early, 
Paul, do you have any problems at work? As she ran her palm up my cheek, she inquired. What are you doing? I just left early to go to the gym for a workout and a swim, she said. There is nothing major about it. I felt the urge to engage in some stress-relieving activities, and my smile never gave any indication of the turmoil that was occurring inside my head. In response to Christie's announcement that dinner was almost ready to be served, Kathy retreated and went upstairs to change her clothing. Christie's announcement was heard by Kathy. As we ate and discussed the events of the day, the four of us engaged in the typical conversation that occurs during supper time. There was an update that Jason was providing regarding the science project that he and his school friend Ethan were working on together. Her English lesson and the book report that was due the next week were the topics that Christie was discussing in her conversation. As a typical suburban family, they were having a good time together and discussing the things that were most important to them that day. Kathy noted that her company was increasing their coverage zone, and she was extremely busy putting up subcontractors to assist with the cable installations. Kathy's company was expanding their coverage territory. As I sat there, taking in all of this lovely conversation, I couldn't help but think about what a wonderful family I was actually a part of. The question is, what about you, Dad? Have you had a good day? Christy inquired as she smiled at me with the childlike expression of her father. The level of stress at work was a little higher than it normally is. It was discovered that the most recent telephone specs contained a significant error. I came dangerously close to losing my cool in front of the group. My alternative was to provide them with instructions regarding the issues that needed to be rectified, and then I departed the office for the remainder of the day. After getting a nice workout that helped me relieve tension, I went to the gym, and then I came home to rest with my family who was very important to me. In response, I smiled at Christy. I gave her a grin and added, tomorrow will most certainly be a better day in the neighborhood, as she laughed at my comment. I turned my head to look at Kathy, who was sitting across the table from me, and then I said, oh, by the way, Kathy, a Nancy Cobb called this afternoon while I was here to tell you that she got the estimate to get the damage to her car repaired. My tone of voice did not convey any indication of concern in any way when I spoke. Kathy came dangerously close to suffocating on the food that she was eating, and our eyes met for a split second. It was the same sight that emerged in her eyes when I walked in on her in the bathroom and saw the bruise mark on her breast. A look of astonishment and shame appeared in her eyes once more. Her expression conveyed a sense of instantaneous terror and horror over her face. As I waited for Kathy to respond, I did not use an accusatory tone in my voice. I instead said, she would like you to call her tonight, her car is at the repair shop and she wants to talk to you about the cost. The initial estimate is around $550. I was able to observe that Kathy's mind was operating at a speed of 100 miles per hour as she created a response in her head. Despite the fact that she lowered her eyes to gaze at the food that was on her plate, it was clear that she was unable to continue to look me in the eyes. Last but not least, Kathy finally spoke out and asked in a hushed voice, what else did Nancy say about the accident? Mom had an accident, Jason blurted out, his eyes widening in anticipation of the possibility of hearing some information that was quite thrilling. My response interrupted Kathy's response by saying, I guess so, Jason. It seems that mom backed into this lady's car in a parking lot, while she was speaking. When it was Christie's turn to join the conversation, she asked, Gee mom, when did this happen? Was anybody hurt? Slow down, you too, and give your mother a chance to tell us all about it, I said to the children in an effort to quiet them down so that Kathy might have a chance to speak. Kathy inquired once more, did Nancy say anything else about the accident? Nancy had been asked about the accident. I lied to my wife, saying, not that I can recall. She seemed like she was in a hurry or something, which was something I had never actually done to her before. Might it have been a simple white lie, or might it have been a deception that was intended to trap someone? For the time being, Kathy appeared to be relieved. It was just a minor fender bender in the parking lot. No one was hurt, and there was no damage to my car. The bumper of my car broke the lady's taillight and made a small dent in her fender, that's all that happened. There was no other information available. Jason re-entered the conversation with his inquiries, the first of which was, I was kind of disappointed. When did this happen, Mom? Where did this happen? It happened last week, Wednesday. I needed to get Carol at work a birthday present, so I went to the mall to acquire it. It was her birthday on Thursday, and I needed to find a present for her to give her. Christie's mother glanced at her with a surprised expression on her face as she asked, You were at the mall and you didn't take me? 
Kathy responded in a calm and matter-of-fact manner. If Christy had to choose between having a sleepover with all of her girlfriends and going shopping at the mall, she would choose the latter. I ran over to the mall at lunchtime. It was a quick in-and-out trip. I got Carol a silk scarf along with a charm for her bracelet, Kathy responded as Christy had a juvenile pout on her face. I got Carol a charm for her bracelet while I was there. Maybe Nancy was wrong about the day, maybe it was Wednesday and not Tuesday as she said on the phone, but I don't think she could be that wrong about where the accident occurred. Why did Kathy have to change the location and the day? The suspicious worm began to penetrate my conscious consciousness more deeply. The expression of amazement that Kathy wore on her face, the sight that she had in her eyes. What is going on in those eyes that are so closed? My devoted wife is trying to keep something from me, but what is it? So it was no big deal, Tom remarked with a tone of dissatisfaction in his head. My hunch is that he was praying for a more severe accident to occur. There was no increase in his degree of curiosity despite the broken taillight. That's right, Tom, it's not a big deal. It's just that Carol's gift is going to cost me more than I really wanted to pay, Kathy revealed with a gentle smile on her lips. It's just that I really wanted to pay for it. Her composure appeared to have been restored in a very short amount of time. No further action was taken by me on the matter. By the time the evening wore on, the students were already up in their rooms, working on their assignments. It was Nancy who had called, and Kathy had gone to our bedroom to answer her call. Perhaps she desired to have a private conversation with Nancy. There was no question in my mind as to why she required some solitude for the call. While I was sitting in the den, the stereo was playing, and the television was turned off. My lap was occupied with a book that was open, and I was holding a glass of Jack Daniels in my hand. At that moment, my mind was operating in the most analytical mode possible. I was gradually and deliberately going through the preceding few months, looking for any additional hints or unexpected occurrences that would further support an idea of infidelity that was developing in my head. I was attempting to find any evidence that could support this theory. Not a single thing, not even a single thing, save for the fact that over those months, there was nothing that would lead me to believe that our relationship had changed in any way. The quality of our sexual lives has not abruptly improved or deteriorated. There was no change in the caring and thoughtful nature of Kathy as a wife. She did not take any alternative clothing. There were no business travels that she had to take, nor did she have to work late into the night. Consequently, why is it that I can't seem to shake this nagging feeling in my head? On the other hand, what I saw in her eyes was a look that I had never seen before, and it appeared twice. It was impossible to explain away the momentary expression of astonishment and remorse that appeared on her face for a couple of seconds. When I thought about lying about the vehicle accident, my chest muscles tightened up. These unpleasant thoughts were leading me to feel uncomfortable. The words that Kathy spoke as she entered the room brought my attention back to the present tense. I told Nancy to have her car repaired, and I would pay the repair shop as soon as the work was done, she added. It appeared as though she was anticipating that I would elaborate further on the accident by giving me a gaze that was interested. In addition, I did not make any comments or inquiries. I'm sorry I didn't mention the accident the day it happened, honey. I just was very tense over the incident and I didn't want you to stress over it. I was going to tell you after I got the call from Nancy. It seems you got her call first. I am sorry I didn't tell you sooner, Kathy said as she settled into her seat on the sofa directly in front of me. I received the impression that she was still concerned about something, but she was unsuccessful in bringing it up since she did not know how to approach the topic. There is a possibility that she discovered that Nancy had disclosed to me the precise location and time of the accident. It's possible that she wanted me to raise some questions to her regarding the inconsistency in her account. I'm glad you settled the matter with Nancy. I'm glad it wasn't any more serious, was my straightforward response to her. Kathy appeared to feel a little bit more relieved after I responded to her. Her inquiries appeared to put an end to the accident incident at this point. Aren't you going to watch Lost Tonight on TV? It is on tonight, isn't it? The idea of ruminating on this sticky matter made no sense to her at all. No, I think I'll skip the show for now. I have enough convoluted mystery and going on at this time. I'll let Jack and the rest of the crew on the island manage by themselves this week, I smiled at her and took another sip of my drink. I'll let them handle everything on their own. As she got up from the sofa and walked up to me with a smile on her face, Kathy said, Well then, I think I'll go upstairs and pour myself a hot tub filled with bubble bath. Then I'll soak in it until my skin turns pink. 
Kathy was referring to the fact that she would spend a lot of time in the hot tub. A kiss on the forehead was given to me by her as she leaned over. Would you check on the kids before you go to bed? I want to make sure that their homework is done and that they don't stay up too late, she said in a voice that was the same lovely and caring voice that I have come to know and love over the course of the previous 16 years. I made a kissing sound with my lips as she smiled and moved toward the stairs. Sure will, lover. I'll crack the whip if I have to tame those two monsters of ours. Now go and enjoy your soak in the tub, I said. Now go and enjoy your soak in the tub. Don't stay up too late, lover boy. I'll be in bed waiting for you, she chuckled as she climbed the stairs. I'll be waiting for you. When she is in the mood, Kathy shows that she is a woman who is both sexy and passionate. She is always in a good mood after taking a hot bath with bubbles. I had a feeling that we were going to have a steamy night in bed together. As soon as I climbed into bed, the first thing that sprang to my mind was how those suspicions would influence the deep sentiments I have for the woman whom I adore and worship. Despite the fact that I had no concrete evidence of any kind marital adultery on her part, I couldn't shake the nagging feeling of mistrust that wouldn't go away. A half an hour later, I walked upstairs to check on the children and turned off everything that was downstairs. In his palm, Jason was concentrating intently on the video game he was playing. Okay, young man, please show me the homework assignment, I said as I swiftly pulled the Game Boy away from his grasp. It's time to get started. Putting on a pout, Jason remarked, Oh dad, I was just about to get to the 10th level. Now you messed it all up. Jason's expression was one of disappointment. You'll have all summer to get to the 12th level if that's your goal. Right now, we're trying to get you through the 5th grade at school, I gently nudged him in the ribs with my fingers. Now, the homework, young man. The disturbance that Christ heard came from her brother, who was sleeping in the other bedroom. Christ was already in bed. I was the target of her desire to perform the daddy's little girl routine on me. It never failed to function. First, I wished her a good night kiss, and then I switched out the light. I had an amazing sexual experience with Kathy that night. After putting our bodies in a lover's embrace and falling into a deep sleep, we were able to find peace and quiet. During that particular Saturday, Kathy and her sister went out to do some shopping for themselves. The children were over to Todd's house, where they were playing with their cousins, while Todd was responsible for watching the children. To my good fortune, I had nothing really interesting to do in a peaceful house to myself. As a result of my restlessness, I made the decision to wash both of our vehicles. However, Kathy's vehicle was still parked in the garage because Evelyn had drove her SUV. Due to the fact that it was a beautiful day outside, I took my time cleaning and vacuuming both of the vehicles. In addition to cleaning the carpets, I also cleaned the trunks of both vehicles. I saw a small piece of white plastic protruding from the edge of the wheel well compartment of Kathy's automobile as I was vacuuming the trunk of her vehicle. After removing the mat, I discovered a white bag that was resting on top of the spare tire beneath it. It was almost as if my heart had stopped beating inside my chest when I opened the package. Several items of intimate clothing, such as a seductive lace bra, black stockings, a garter belt, and underwear, were contained within the bag. It appeared as though the products were something that a woman would purchase from Victoria's Secret. It was the first time I had ever seen these outfits. I knew they were not brand new since all of the sale tags had been taken off them, and they appeared to have been worn before. I also realized that they were not brand new. There was a strong whiff of female odor emanating from the crotch of the pants, and it was Kathy's fragrance. I was completely bewildered as I stood there, staring at a bag full of items that were intended for a single function. Is it possible that I was holding the clincher in my hand? It was possible that this was the missing piece of the puzzle that I had been trying to convince myself not to believe for the past few weeks. After putting everything back in the bag, I went back to the location where I had found the bag. After putting away the cleaning supplies, I returned Kathy's vehicle to its parking spot in the garage. Any anybody who could have witnessed me at that precise moment would have been under the impression that they were observing a robot or a zombie strolling around the automobiles. I was in a haze, and my mind was uncooperative and refused to work properly. My thoughts were filled with nothing but disorder and confusion at all times. At last, I secured the door to the house and drove to the convenience shop located around the corner. The next thing I did was drive over to the lake after purchasing a six-pack of beer. We were able to find a parking spot that was secluded and away from the weekend bustle. With a nice beer in my hand, I sat back and attempted to make sense of the events that had transpired over the course of the previous couple of weeks. 
All I had was a hazy notion that Kathy might have been unfaithful up until the point where I discovered the lingerie that was hidden in the trunk of Kathy's car. Now that the most recent discovery has been made, is there any possibility that she has been unfaithful? At the time, I was under the impression that there was no alternative plausible explanation. Yet, I was completely clueless about what the next step should be. Should you confront her right away? Make demands for answers and evidence that she is faithful. Should I have kept my mouth shut until I had tangible evidence that could not be refuted? Even if that were the case, what would I do with the evidence that was so damning? Can I get a divorce from her? In spite of the fact that my intellect is often very strong at evaluating situations, it was failing me at a terrible rate. The problem did not appear to have a solution that would benefit both parties. It would have taken several hours to complete the sixth beer if Kathy had, in fact, been unfaithful to us over the course of our marriage. As the sun descended below the horizon, it was visible across the lake. As a result of the alcohol, I experienced a mild buzz, but I was not even close to being intoxicated. It dawned on me that I was starving and that I needed to get back home. However, what was I going to do when I arrived at my house? In order to preserve the current state of affairs, what type of life would I have to choose to lead? Kathy's explanation for all of my suspicions was the final piece of the puzzle that was missing from the equation. Would it be possible for her to provide sensible reasons that would allay all of my concerns? When I got home, I would find Kathy talking on the phone. At the moment that I entered the house, she turned around and looked at me, her face displaying a look of concern and fear. My God, Paul! Where have you been all afternoon? You had us worried sick. You weren't here when Evelyn and I got back from shopping. Todd didn't know where you were either, she said with a high level of agitation in her voice as she threw down the phone. You had us worried sick. Following my entrance into the kitchen area, I went to the refrigerator to retrieve a glass of ice-cold water there. Up until the moment that I sat down at the table, our eyes had never met. I was out at the lake. I have a lot on my mind that I needed to think about and try to sort out. I looked up at her, and our eyes connected. I was trying to figure out what happened. Seeing the terror in her eyes was clear to me. Her mind was trying to evaluate the words that were being spoken by the individual who was seated at the table, and she was experiencing a mixture of fear and worry. Even while her words were filled with concern, they did not communicate the sense of dread that she was experiencing on the inside. What's wrong, Paul? Are you sick or something, she said. At that precise moment, Kathy's tough facade disintegrated right in front of my eyes. Yes, you could say I'm sick, but it's not a physical illness. I'm sick in my soul, she said. It was beyond any reasonable doubt in her mind that I was aware of her secret. As she slumped into one of the seats in the kitchen, she did so slowly. What's his name? Are you in love with him? I said in a tone of voice that was calm and did not contain any anger or accusatory tone. As tears began to form in her eyes, Kathy turned her gaze toward me. His name is Carl Garung, and yes, I am in love with him. I simply sat there and looked at my wife, who was crying. Her quick revelation did not leave me feeling stunned, nor did it cause me to feel queasy in my stomach. It was just now that my suspicions about her cheating on me were proven to be correct. The anxiety that I had been experiencing ever since I discovered her store of gorgeous lingerie in the trunk of her car washed out of me, leaving me with an emotional shell that was devoid of any feelings. If you are in love with him, I guess that means the end of our marriage, I said with a calm tone in my voice. Oh God, no, Paul! Kathy shouted out as a scared look flashed across her face. I still love you, Paul. My love for Carl does not diminish the love I have for you, Kathy's voice cracked, and her body shook as if she had just been hit by a blast of cold air. I still love you, Paul. Well, you're sadly mistaken if you think I will ever accept the role of a cock, and I do not wish to live with a woman who professes her love for another man. The only other option that I can think of for us is to get a divorce. I made my way out of the kitchen area and into the den, where I decided to take a seat in the recliner that I find most comfortable. My wife had been unfaithful to me, and I did not want to look at her anymore. The decision to divorce was now something that I considered to be an unavoidable outcome. The time it took for Kathy to restore her calm and become able to communicate with me was several minutes. She took a seat on the sofa opposite me and remained silent for a brief period of time before she spoke. I know this must be a terrible shock to you, Paul, finding out that I have been unfaithful to you. However, I really think you should listen to my explanation before you end our marriage, she tried to say in a gentle and loving voice, 
but I simply ignored her and turned my face away from hers. She closed her eyes, took a long breath, and simply responded, yes. Tell me one thing, Kathy. Do you still want to have a sexual relationship with this Carl guy? She asked. Yes. Then there is nothing left of our marriage. Since you are the adulterous partner, I will file the divorce papers in the morning. I will seek primary custody of the children. I do not wish to expose my young, impressionable children to an adulterous environment. If you want Carl as your lover, then it will have to be without having custody of the children. My voice had turned into an aggressive tone of voice. In my capacity as the leader of the family and the spouse who felt wronged, it was time for me to assert my authority. Kathy's infidelity may have caused me to feel a cut to my ego, but I was not going to give in and give her custody of the children. Please, Paul, don't do this. I told you I still love you. I don't want a divorce, and I especially do not want to have my children taken away from me, Kathy cried out, shivering, as the realization of my decision began to set in. I don't want to have my children taken away from me. Your I love you statement is a farce when you also profess your love for another man. Your actions speak louder than any of your words. Your actions tell me I am not the man who can completely satisfy you as a woman. I cannot and will not accept a cuckold position. I raised my head and in a voice that was more gentle expressed my opinion. I want you to pack a suitcase and leave this house immediately. I no longer want to be in the same house with you. You have lost your right to be a resident in this house. As I stood up, Kathy was on the verge of bursting into tears. No, Paul, you can't just throw me out like an old shoe. This is my home. My children and I live here, she said. I live here. I live here with my children. You are an adulterous woman, and I won't have you living in the same house with us. I shouted at her as my feelings of anger grew within within myself. Now get your clothes packed and leave this house. I'm going to get the kids at Evelyn's, and when I get back, I don't want to find you in this house. I walked to the front door, turned around, and said, I'll be back in an hour. Don't be here. Tell Evelyn where you will be staying, and I'll see that you get the rest of your belongings. I pulled the door shut behind me as Kathy persisted in pleading with me to reconsider my decision. It was immediately apparent to Todd that there was a significant problem with the hunter's home the moment I walked through the door. I had never before appeared to him in such a distressed state. As Todd approached me, he asked, What the hell has happened to you? as he made his way closer to me. While I was leaning against the wall, I uttered the words, Bad, Todd. Very bad. After I had finished speaking, I slowly rotated my head from side to side. Kathy has gotten herself a lover, and she doesn't want to end the affair. It's over for the two of us. I told her to pack some clothes and leave the house. I'll be filing for divorce in the morning. Astonished by the things that I had just spoken, Todd stood there in silence. There was never any indication that our marriage was in danger, on the contrary, it was doing really well. We gave off the impression of being the perfect married couple, with two beautiful children. Kathy and I, exactly at that moment, Evelyn suddenly appeared around the corner and found us standing there in stunned stillness. What's going on here? She asked, her eyes darting quickly from the face of her husband to the face of me with a questioning expression. Paul has just learned that Kathy has been cheating on him, Todd whispered deeply as he gazed intently at his wife. Kathy has been cheating on him. Do you know anything about this? Kathy tells you everything, doesn't she? The expression on Evelyn's face was unable to conceal the fact that she was aware of Kathy's secret. She didn't tell me everything. Only that she had met her long-lost high school sweetheart. She didn't tell me she was sleeping with him. Her tone of voice wasn't particularly convincing. In an accusatory tone, I said at her, So you, you knew something was not right with this, didn't you, Evelyn? I was blaming her for something. I tried to tell her not to get involved with Carl. Their relationship in high school was in the past, and she should not jeopardize her marriage trying to relive some teenage fantasy. It was impossible for her to look me in the eyes since her eyes were suddenly fixed on a certain area on the floor. How long ago was this, Evelyn? I yelled at her out of the blue. A hushed voice could be heard Evelyn saying, about eight weeks ago. In spite of the fact that my anger was still building up, I asked, what else do you know? Kathy told me Carl owns a small construction company. He didn't know Kathy worked for CA Neck when he applied for subcontracting work. Kathy was shocked when she first saw his name on the application form. Evelyn stepped out of the hallway and sat down on the sofa, her head lowered in embarrassment. After she told me she met Carl for lunch, she no longer talked to me about him. 
I tried to find out if anything was going on between them, she refused to talk to me about Carl. Evelyn let out a profound sigh of relief. I had a dark suspicion that she was beginning an affair with Carl. Todd had not said anything as his wife admitted her awareness of the communication between Kathy and Carl. I suspect that she was beginning an affair with Carl. At this moment, he was completely at a loss for words and actions. When I was with my sister-in-law, I yelled at her, Goddamn women. Even though she is your sister, you should have told Todd or me that something might be happening with Kathy. Now it's too late. Our marriage is over. I told Kathy to pack her bags and get out of my house. The veins in my neck were quite visible as my wrath was becoming out of control. As she looked up at me, Evelyn's eyes blazed with terror. You're not throwing Kathy out into the street. She's your wife, and I know she loves you, Paul, she said. At this point, Evelyn was beginning to cry out loud. She also told me she loves Carl and that she wants to continue her affair with him. I responded to her by yelling, that goddamn woman deserves to be out on the street. I was aware that I needed to get away from Evelyn before my anger became out of control and the situation became even more dangerous. I looked across at Todd and asked, where are Jason and Christy? After turning around and making my way to the back door, Todd informed me that the children were playing in the backyard. As I was leaving the house to go get the kids, the phone that was sitting on the end table began to ring. Come on, gang, let's go get some burgers at Mickey's, I said with a false smile on my face. The two little children ran over to me as soon as they spotted me. Come on, gang, let's go get some burgers at Mickey's. Having a girlish smile on her face, Christy inquired, Dad, would it be possible for all three of us to come along with us? Sure, they can if their mother and father say it's okay, I responded in response. As Christy hurriedly entered the house, she yelled out to the other people, let's go in and ask them, and they all followed her. According to Christy, who was sitting in the back seat of the car, Evelyn was on the phone talking to Kathy. Why was Aunt Evelyn crying when I went into the house? She's having a bad day. I think she got some bad news that disturbed her, I responded to my daughter. I think she thought. The talk was interrupted by Jason, who asked, is that the reason she stated that she wanted Alan, Alexis, and Alyssa to stay at home tonight, dad for tonight? Jason and Christy were in the process of completing their french fries when I turned away from them and pressed the speed dial button on my cell phone. I guess so, Jason. There are a lot of things going on right now that will upset a lot of people. We can talk more about this when we get home that we can discuss more. There was a series of rings on the phone, and eventually a woman's voice answered. A voice called out, hello? It was Evelyn. I spoke to her in a low voice and told her, Kathy had better not be there when we get home because we are going to be leaving here in a shorter amount of time. I was able to get the youngsters to pay attention to my phone talk since they were more interested in the activities that were taking place around them. Evelyn was attempting to act as a mediator for her sister, Kathy, when she said, Paul, be reasonable. Kathy is going through a major emotional crisis over this. She has nowhere to go and she does not want to be without her children. My anger was rising once more as I screamed, I don't give a damn where she goes. She can go live with her new lover for all I care. I hit the off button and took a long breath as I attempted to bring my wrath under control. She had better not be there when we get home, or the children will learn the hard way what a cheating and immoral woman their mother really is, I said. In response to the peculiar expression that appeared on my face, Christy inquired, What's wrong, Daddy? In an effort to appear easygoing and smile, I did my best. Nothing really, sweetie. We'll talk more when we get home. When the three of us arrived at our home, the house was completely empty. In response to the sight of the vacant house, both of them inquired, Where is Mommy? She had something she needs to do. Mommy will be away for a while while things get straightened out, I said in order to avoid giving a serious response to the children's query. I had a feeling that I would have to have a really difficult conversation with both of them very soon. Now, get upstairs to your rooms. I need the assignment to be finished within the next hour. After I wake up, I will tuck you in and wish you a good night. As soon as I entered the bedroom, I observed that Kathy's side of the master closet was missing a significant number of her possessions, specifically her clothing. Additionally, her cosmetics were not present on the vanity that was located in the bathroom. Despite the fact that my anger was still at the forefront of my mind, I experienced a profound sense of loss as the reality of Kathy's disappearance began to sink in. But despite this, I was aware that there were more agonizing times waiting for me in the future. 
As I laid back in the bedroom, which was completely black, I looked up at the ceiling. I would have to address a great deal of information in the near future because there were so many specifics. The psychological health and overall well-being of my two children would be the most important thing to me. What is the best way to disseminate the news to your children that their mother will no longer be residing with them? Would you believe that she will not be there to love and soothe them each and every night? Is it true that she will not be present to serve as their doctor when they are ill? In my own head, I was having a hard time deciding whether or not to pursue legal action to gain custody of the children. My wish was for them to have a joyful and healthy childhood. Do you think it would be more beneficial for them to live with their mother and her new lover? It could have been my ego that was hurt. It's possible that my attachment to my children was the true cause, but I quickly disregarded that possibility. I was unable to give up the children to my wife, who had been having an affair. I would do everything in my power to ensure that they would continue to reside in this house with me. I went through a series of horrific and heartbreaking experiences over the next few days. Immediately, I started the process of getting a divorce through my current attorney. In order to prevent Kathy from having any contact with either myself or the children, I was successful in obtaining a restraining order. The restraining order was being challenged by Kathy, who had retained legal representation, however, the outcome of the case would not be determined for at least a week. Jason and Christ were now perplexed and dismayed by the events that were taking place in their home, which had previously been filled with joy and affection. I had sat down with them and attempted to explain that their mother and father were experiencing a number of significant challenges which were preventing them from remaining married to each other. What was going on was beyond the comprehension of the children, and they were unable to comprehend why their parents could not simply kiss and make up. I informed them that there were problems that were far too severe to simply erase from their minds. Regarding the new boyfriend that their mother has, I did not directly inform them about it. Despite the fact that these incidents with the children were extremely distressing, I was resolute in my decision to maintain my position. I finally got the chance to speak with Kathy over the phone a week after I had forced her to leave the house, and during that conversation, I made my initial threats to her. That there are rules in our state that prohibit the alienation of attachment by a third party was something that I told her. Kathy was informed that I would file charges against Carl and sue him for alienation of affection and destruction of our marriage if she continued to insist on battling the matter of my custody of the children. I also threatened to sue Carl for destroying our marriage. In addition, I informed her that I would disclose her affair to the senior executives of Cakes as a potential indication of a conflict of interest on her behalf. If this were to happen, she would most likely be terminated from her position, and Carl's company would be barred from conducting business with Cable Next. In addition, Kathy persisted in pleading with me to halt the divorce proceedings and allow her to go back to her house. In response to these pleadings, I responded with snarky remarks about how she had already made her decision. I made it abundantly clear that I would not be a cuck or live in a marriage arrangement that was open to the public. To add insult to injury, I informed her that I have never been interested in sloppy seconds and that I do not keep damaged products around. Kathy continued to beg me to rethink despite the fact that the phone call had come to an end. Following that, I engaged in a lengthy conversation with my sister-in-law regarding Jason and Christie's visit with their mutual relatives. I made it abundantly clear to her that I would not allow Kathy to visit Evelyn's residence if the children were present, and I did not allow her to do so. As part of my engagement with the Hunter family, I outlined the guidelines for behavior that would govern our interactions. I finally succeeded in getting Evelyn to give in to my demands for the sake of the five children. She was aware that if I were to limit or cancel the visits that the cousins had with one another, it would be detrimental to both families. As the major caregiver and the one who would have custody of the children, the divorce papers were drafted with me as the individual. My warnings were taken seriously by Kathy, and she immediately retracted her objections to that particular aspect of the arrangement. In the event that her lover was not there during the visitation periods, she would be granted visitation rights every other weekend. She would bring the children to her sister's place, where she would pick them up and leave them off, so that I would not have to be present when she attended their home. Because of this mutual understanding, the divorce process was able to proceed even farther. When I peered into the mirror in the bathroom one month after Kathy had moved out of the house, I saw a guy who had aged 10 years in the span of just four weeks. During each and every evening, the children put pressure on me to reconcile with their mother in order to facilitate her return to our home. These verbal altercations were having a negative impact on all three of us personally. In addition to the fact that I had lost my wife, I now had the impression that I was quite close to losing the love of my children. 
In order to further strengthen my relationship with the children, I decided to take an early vacation from work. Despite the fact that the children's relationship with me gradually became less tense, I could still tell that they were missing their mother in the joyful family life they had formerly known. I was finding that being a single parent was producing a lot of stress for me. After much deliberation, I made the decision to hire a housekeeper who would also serve as a live-in maid. In addition, I did this to make certain that there would be a responsible adult there at the house when the children came home from school. Margarita was a Latino grandmother who was in her later years and happily accepted the post. As soon as she moved into one of the guest bedrooms, she quickly assumed responsibility for all of the responsibilities around the house. In a short amount of time, Jason and Christy made the decision to adopt her and make her their foster grandma. She started teaching the children Spanish in addition to her other responsibilities, which included taking care of the housework. A calm and steady atmosphere gradually made its way back to the Matthews house. The children ceased pressuring me to enable their mother to return to the house. The weekends the youngsters spent with their mother soon became part of their routine. They seemed better able to cope to not having their mother reside in the same house with them. The return home after their visitations with her became less stressful for them. Margarita always had their favorite food ready for them when they arrived home from their stay with Kathy. Still, it wasn't the same loving family anymore. My life was very hard because of trauma. I suffered after the discovery of Kathy's infidelity and then the loss of her presence in the house. Down deep, I truly missed her love and companionship. I went about my daily routines at home and at work as best I could. At times, my actions were more robotic than that of a thinking individual. There was a huge hole inside my mind and soul, something very valuable had been ripped from my perfect life, something that might never be able to be replaced. The once close relationship between the hunters and me now had a very large chasm between us. The cousins remained very close friends and still shared much of their time together, but the closeness I once had with Evelyn and Todd had diminished to almost nothing because of the rules I had set down weeks ago. Evelyn had never tried to persuade me to give Kathy another chance. Evelyn was caught between loyalty to her sister and her feeling that Kathy was solely responsible for the misery which now existed in the two families. One evening when I went over to pick up the children at Evelyn's, she took me aside and handed me a large manila envelope. I know the rules you set down about my getting involved with this marital crisis you and Kathy are having, but I absolutely believe you need to read the letter Kathy has written to you. It's in this envelope, and it may contain some of the answers to questions you have been afraid to ask. Please don't destroy this letter before you read it, Paul, she handed the envelope to me. I took it reluctantly. I will not bother you further about this situation. It's between you and Kathy. I only want to plead with you to read the letter before the divorce is finalized. You owe it to yourself. I hesitated in speaking to Evelyn, we both knew she broke my standing rule about her getting involved. Instead. I just grimaced and walked past her to retrieve the children. I left the hunter's house with the children chattering away and with the envelope in my hand. It was several days of looking at the unopened envelope I had taken to work. Supposedly inside the envelope was an explanation and possible confession written by my soon-to-be ex-wife. Do I dare read it? Would the contents of the letter be like salt in the wound and increase my anger toward her? I opened the envelope on the third day. I sat alone in my office after telling my secretary not to disturb me. There appeared to be about a dozen pages in the envelope. They were written in Kathy's beautiful cursive handwriting. Just seeing her handwriting gave a sudden jolt to my chest. At first, I thought about feeding those pages to the paper shredder, but I didn't. Slowly, with tears forming in my eyes, I began to read the first page. My dearest loving husband, it is my sincere wish that you read this entire letter before you make your final decision about the future of our marriage. Since we have been unable to sit down face to face and discuss the situation we find ourselves in at this time, my only recourse is to write you this letter and try my best to explain everything concerning this crisis from my perspective. I know that some of what I have to say you may find contradictory and irrational from your point of view. Still, I need at least to do my best to communicate the facts as I see them. First and most important, I want you to know that I truly love you more today than I did the day we were married. You must believe this fact, even. If you doubt everything else I have to say in this letter, these past 16 years have been the best years of my life, and I owe all of them to you and our wonderful children. I truly wish to remain your wife for the rest of my life. Second, you need to know that none of what has happened recently was any fault of yours. You are the most wonderful husband a woman could ever ask for. 
Nothing, and I do mean nothing, in you or your relationship with me drove me into the arms of another man. You completely satisfied me in and out of the bedroom. What has happened was not due to any deficiency in you. Thirdly, I have no clear explanation of how and why things turned out the way they have. I never, in my wildest dreams or nightmares, could have envisioned a scenario that would have brought you and me to this critical junction in our lives. If what follows in this letter turns out to be disjointed or jumbled, please bear with me. It's a hard story to tell, and I hope I can tell it so you can fully understand why I am in this heart-wrenching dilemma and why I am still begging you not to end our marriage. My story starts out during my sophomore year at Crestview High School. I was a happy young girl who was just beginning to blossom into a lovely young woman. It was in March of that year, three months before the end of the school year, that Carl Gring transferred into Crestview. Carl's dad was a major in the U.S. Army who was sent to help with the training of the reserve soldiers at the local armory. The Gring family moved into a rental house about three miles from the high school, the opposite direction from where I lived. Carl ended up in three of my classes, English literature, geometry, and biology. It was obvious from the first week that the school Carl had previously attended was not on par with Crestview's curriculum. Carl was having a hard time keeping up with the rest of the class. One day, on a dare from my best girlfriend Betty, I went over to sit with Carl during lunch period. He was sitting by himself. I guess he was trying to figure out how to break into the school's student body instead of being looked on as an outsider. Carl was a little surprised and, I think, somewhat happy when I asked if I could sit with him. This first lunch meeting was just an introduction. It ended up that Carl and I had lunch every day from then on. Betty even joined us most of the time. That's when Carl told us about his dad, his mom, and his little sister Jennifer. The Gring family had moved around the country and to several overseas locations in the 20 years Carl's parents were married. Such was life for the family of a career soldier. After that first week of lunch meetings, Betty and I began to tutor Carl in the classes he was having trouble keeping up with. The three of us formed a study group, which helped Carl enough that he graduated to junior grade with a 3.2 average. We were all proud of his accomplishment. Yet, during all that time, neither Betty nor I actually dated Carl. We were just happy to hang out together and enjoy each other's company. That summer between our sophomore and junior years, Carl was sent to his grandparents' ranch in Idaho. I was pretty bummed out for those three months until school started and Carl returned from Idaho. Even though Carl and I had not been on a formal date, I was beginning to have some very strong feelings for him. I even challenged Betty to see if she was becoming infatuated with Carl, but Betty had her eyes set on a different guy in our class. Before school began in the fall, I knew I would get Carl for my steady boyfriend. When he returned for the fall semester, it was obvious something was wrong in his life. I finally got him to tell me that his father was not happy with his current assignment and was pressing his superior officers to transfer him to an active duty unit somewhere in Europe. The thought of relocating again had both Carl and his mother very upset. Within the first month of starting back to school, Carl and I had our first date. I was on cloud nine. I had someone who I was truly falling in love with. You might think it was puppy love or just a teenage crush, but in fact, it was more than that. As Carl and I became exclusive with one another, we found that we were emotionally compatible and that our ideals were very similar. Even though Carl and I were steady dates, we never had sex together. There were some nights parked in his car where some very heavy petting and groping took place, but we never crossed the line. He never fingered me or asked me to touch his genitals. Both Carl and I thought sex was to be saved for marriage. We would often sit in his car looking at the stars and telling each other the various versions of how our life would be after we got married. Carl was adamant that he would not become an army officer like his father, he saw the effect all the moving around from base to base had on his family's life. That was not the life he wanted for his new family. He looked forward to settling down, establishing roots in one town with one woman and a house full of kids. The holiday season came around very fast that year, at least it seemed that way to me. On Christmas Eve, Carl gave me a friendship ring, which he said was to be my pre-engagement ring. It was a very merry Christmas and a happy new year for me. Spring came racing around as the bond between Carl and I grew stronger and stronger. I was fearful he would be sent back to his grandparents' ranch again once school let out for the summer. He told me he would fight that decision and find a summer job somewhere around town. It was the last month of the school year when the bomb dropped. Carl's father had finally convinced his superior officers he would be able to contribute more to the army at an active duty station. 
he got his transfer orders to Stuttgart, Germany. Carl came to school the next day, and I immediately knew something was terribly wrong. My first thought was that his father was going to send him back to his grandparents for the summer. When Carl told me he and his family were moving to Germany by the end of June, my world literally exploded. I broke down in hysterics and had to be sent to the nurse's office. I was a total wreck for the remainder of the school year, my grades plummeted. If it had not been for my previous high grades, I would never have passed on to my senior year. All kinds of thoughts raced through my mind. I even told Carl we should run away and elope, but Carl was the cooler head. He knew we were way too young to make it on our own. The day finally came when Carl's family left for the airport and their new life in Germany. Our farewell was like someone tearing my heart out while it was still beating. I was totally devastated. It was a good thing we were out of school for the summer. My parents saw the depression I was in and managed to get me into counseling and therapy before school began in September. The therapy did help me, and I continued with it throughout my senior year. Carl and I wrote daily letters to each other. You have to remember, this was the time before the internet and email. Our letters were both loving and sorrowful, we missed each other, and I firmly believe the separation was increasing our love for each other. I did not date any other guys during my senior year. In fact, I did not even attend the senior prom. At the end of the year, I was Carl's girl, and I would remain faithful to him no matter what. Instead of chasing and dating other boys in my senior class, I concentrated all of my efforts on improving my grade point average and making a high score on my SAT test. All of that effort paid off in the form of acceptance and a scholarship to Cal Berkeley. My sister, Evelyn, was already a student at Cal Berkeley. She would be able to help me with the relocation and getting me started on campus. All of those wonderful things made me very happy. In his letters, Carl also praised my efforts and the results. Still, I didn't look forward to the summer with us still thousands of miles apart. In August, the second bomb went off, but it was not as immediate in its destructive force as the first bomb about the Jings move to Germany. This time, the bomb came as an interruption to the stream of daily letters which Carl and I exchanged. There was an entire week where I didn't get any mail from Carl. I became very worried about Carl, and I even tried to contact him by phone, but that didn't work out. The phone number had been changed. In the next letter I received from Carl, he told me his dad had been accidentally killed during a training exercise. His letter was very short, and he told me he was having difficulties with his mother. He did not elaborate. I continued sending my daily letters to Carl, trying to extend my sympathy for the loss of his father and trying to give him some encouragement during those very tough times. The last letter I received from Carl told me his mother was very sick and she had been sent to a hospital. He was now trying his best to care for his younger sister and to put the family things in order. He signed his letter professing his undying love for me and stating that one day we would be together. I continued to write to Carl every day, even though I was not receiving any response. September found me on the campus of Cal Berkeley with my sister, Evelyn. I was not sure I was emotionally ready to take on the challenges of university life. All I could think of was my true love in Germany, facing some extremely hard tasks, and I was not there to help him. If it had not been for Evelyn helping me through those first months at the university, I'm sure I would have flunked out. It was during the Thanksgiving holidays that the first of my letters was returned to me marked return to sender, address unknown. That small notice on the envelope was like a dagger through my heart. I had not gotten a letter from Carl in over a month, and now it seemed he would not be receiving any of my letters. I was a lost soul. Nothing in my life seemed to matter to me anymore. I felt I could have died and not regretted leaving my empty world. Once again, it was Evelyn and her constant mothering which gave me the courage to move forward. I finally had to resume my therapy, this time with a different therapist. Through her help and guidance, I pulled myself together and once again focused all of my energy on my studies and future career. Still, something deep inside was missing. It must have been part of my soul because I felt spiritually numb and void after a full year of not hearing anything back from Carl. I pushed his memory to the back of my mind and essentially laid him to rest. All of his previous letters were packed in several shoe boxes and stored in the back of my closet. As a side note, Paul, you never knew about those letters. I kept them stored away until the day you proposed marriage to me, your love. That proposal began to heal my wounded soul. That weekend, I burned all of Carl's letters and scattered the ashes into San Francisco Bay. Carl was finally put to rest forever, or so I thought. 
I never told you about Carl, and I told all of my family never to mention him to you or to me ever. What followed after college were sixteen of the most wonderful years that a woman, a wife, and a mother could ever ask for in her entire lifetime. You must believe those words, Paul. They are the absolute truth. This next section of my explanation may sound strange, and some of it absolutely absurd. There will be things in this letter that defy logic and rationality. Yet, after all the dust of my words has settled, you will find one terribly torn and bedeviled woman, a woman who has had to come face to face with some very serious revelations in her life. As you know, one of my major responsibilities at the cable company is to review and approve all subcontractors who perform work or services for CA Nex. The review process of my department focuses on the subcontractor's past and present compliance with all of the state and federal labor laws. We do not issue work contracts to subcontractors who employ illegal immigrants or who violate the work hour laws. Subcontractors are required to fill out a lengthy application form in order to qualify for a cable contract. These applications are screened by two of my assistants, and those applicants who pass the initial screening are then sent to my office for my review. It was March 22 when a stack of applications was placed on my desk. There were six folders for my review, which I began right after lunch. The third folder I opened was the application form from the KG Construction Company. I read the summary page that Loretta, my assistant, had done as part of her initial review. Her summary comments were very favorable for KG Construction, so I began to read the details on the application form. When I got to the section of ownership of the company, it was like I was just slammed into a brick wall at 60 miles per hour, Carl Goering, sole owner of KG Construction Company. I don't know how long it took me to catch my breath after reading Carl's name on the application. My mind seemed to explode inside my head, confusion reigned supreme inside my shell-shocked mind. Could this person be my Carl Goering? Could this person be the Carl Goering who had professed his undying love for me so many years ago? The rest of that day was a total waste for me. I told Loretta to do some more detailed background checking on KG Construction Company and the owner, Carl Goering. I left work early that day and came home to try and get my mind under control again. I needed you and the children around me to reinforce the loving bond we share as a family. As hard as I tried, I could not entirely push the thought of Carl back into that dark, cold dungeon where his memory had been imprisoned for over twenty years. I remember we had a great family night with the four of us chatting and enjoying several games of Scrabble before the children went off to bed. I also remember that we did not make love that night, even though I was in the mood to have you take me intimately. The rest of the week for me was like working in a forced labor camp. I drove myself exceedingly hard to keep my focus on the daily assignments. Friday came and went with Loretta still doing her background check on KG construction. Saturday and Sunday were totally hectic days for me on purpose, every small project I had postponed up to that point, I jumped on with gusto. You even remarked that I must have taken a double dose of my morning vitamins. It was a Herculean task inside my mind to suppress the thoughts of Carl from overwhelming my conscious mind. Monday morning, Loretta came in with another small stack of application folders. She told me the background check on KG construction was on top. She left my office and closed the door behind her. I remember looking at the top folder as if it were a poisonous snake ready to strike. It took me several minutes of staring at the folder before I reached over and opened it. There, on the first page of the background check, was all the information I needed to confirm that this Carl Gring was, in fact, my Carl Gring. The report also indicated that he was single, divorced for eight years, and living in Gilmore, about 26 miles from my office. My body went cold as the flood of suppressed memories slammed into my conscious mind like a tsunami wave. All of those feelings, which I thought were long forgotten and buried, rose up and shook me to my core. It was impossible for me to think any thoughts other than thoughts of Carl and the young love we shared so briefly twenty years ago. Once again, I turned to Evelyn for her advice and consolation. She knew there was a serious problem when I came to her house early in the afternoon to talk to her. She was the only living relative who knew about Carl and the relationship we shared before his father was killed in Germany. She had always been my rock and steadfast advisor, now I needed her advice more than ever. After telling Evelyn about my discovery, she had a very bewildered look on her face. It took her several minutes to compose her thoughts before she told me I must forget all about Carl and let his memory rest in peace. Although it wasn't necessary, she reminded me about the fabulous life we have as a family. She told me Carl was in the past and must remain in the past if I wish to keep our family whole. I knew she was right. 
I knew I had everything a woman could possibly want or expect in a loving family relationship. Still, there was the nagging voice of curiosity that wouldn't shut up inside my mind. The following week, my curiosity could no longer be contained. I had Loretta set up a meeting with Mr. Carl Gring for the following afternoon. Carl had no way of knowing who I was other than I was the final person in the approval process. He was just asked to come to Mrs. Kathy Matthews' office the next afternoon. Despite all my efforts to control myself, my emotions were a raging inferno. What would happen during that first meeting? Would Carl remember me? Would there be any feelings left between us? I didn't sleep very well that night. Driving to work that morning was like driving to war, the apprehension was almost overwhelming. My conscience was in full rebellion, every nerve in my body was frazzled. At 2.30, there was a knock on my door, and Loretta stuck her head around the door to tell me Mr. Carl Gring was here for his 2.30 appointment. Carl stepped into my office, and Loretta closed the door. There was a split second where Carl looked at me with a confused look on his face. Then he simply asked, Kathy, is that you, Kathy? I stood up from my desk on legs that seemed as if they were made of rubber. Yes, Carl, it's me, Kathy. Neither one of us knew what to say next. There was silence for a very long second. Then I told him to take a seat in front of my desk. I could tell Carl was in a mild state of shock at seeing me for the first time in over twenty years. He wasn't sure what he should do or say. I asked him how he was and commented on the fact he was looking very fit and healthy. Still, he was having trouble coming to grips with the situation. I changed topics and then began to tell him about the approval process. He just sat there, not saying a word, as I told him his application had been approved and that he would be able to contact the director of installations to receive his contract assignments. How I managed to speak to him for over 15 minutes without breaking down like a quivering bowl of jello, I'll never know. I just smiled politely when I was done and asked if he had any questions about the contract or the work. He just slowly shook his head no, but his eyes never left my face. When I indicated the meeting was over, he was very slow to rise from the chair. As he got to his feet, he finally seemed to gain some control over his initial shock. He thanked me for approving his company, and then he said he would like to meet with me for lunch. I told him we could meet the next day at Brandon's restaurant across the street from my office. He looked pleased at my response but was still unsure how to end the meeting. So he just smiled and said he would meet me at Brandon's the next day at noon. After Carl left my office, I slumped back into my chair. There was a tightness in my chest as I realized the first lover in my life had just been resurrected from the dead. Nothing happened the next day over lunch except that Carl told me the awful details of what happened after his father was killed. His mother had always been a frail woman, the news of her husband's death caused a nervous breakdown. She had to be committed to a mental hospital. Carl was now forced to assume the role as the head of the family. There was his little sister he had to comfort and support. The army arranged for Carl and Jennifer to be sent back to live with the grandparents, their mother remained behind in the mental hospital. As Carl and his little sister returned to Idaho and settled in with their grandparents, they were given the news that their mother had committed suicide in the hospital. In the brief period of less than a month, Carl and Jennifer were orphans. Carl told me his grief and the burden placed upon him with the deaths of his parents was the major reason he stopped writing to me. He felt he would no longer be able to uphold the promises he made to me. There were other more serious demands placed on him. He wanted me to be happy and to move my life forward, so he stopped writing to me in hopes I would find another man to love. At no time during the lunch conversation did Carl make any statements that he wanted to become a part of my life again. He knew I was married and the mother of two children. I believe he was sincerely happy for me and for my life as your wife. The luncheon ended with a handshake. As Carl walked to his car in the parking lot, I went back to my office and tried to get on with my daily work. Unfortunately for me, those early memories would not go away. As much as I tried to push them into the background, Evelyn continued to advise me not to see Carl again and for me to forget about him. I never told her any more about my meetings with Carl. I guess I was too ashamed to tell her of my adultery. Paul, I really did try to follow Evelyn's advice. For over a week, I wrestled with my internal demons. The following week, I finally gave in and called Carl, asking if we could meet for lunch again. That next lunch was the beginning of my infidelity. There was no seduction or sex involved, but during our meal, I confessed to Carl the fact that I had never stopped loving him. He confessed the same to me. At that moment, I knew I needed to have Carl as a part of my life once again. 
It was me, Paul, not Carl, who started the wheels in motion for what would become several sexual trysts for us before you made your discovery. Somewhere in the following weeks, I became a different person. Somehow, I began to feel like I was two different women living in the same body. When I was with you and the children, I was the same loving wife and mother I had always been. When I was with Carl, I was that young girl again, finding my lost love and once again having him in my arms. I knew it was wrong. No excuses, no defense for my actions. All I can truly say to you, Paul, is my love for you has never diminished. Contrary to many stories you may have read, there was never any competition between you and Carl in my mind. You are my husband, and he could never be my husband. Those were my thoughts during those days of confusion and turmoil for me. Never, and I mean never, did I ever consider leaving you for Carl. All I can hope for at this juncture in our lives is that you will reconsider your decision to proceed with the divorce. I do not want to be the ex-Mrs. Paul Matthews. I want to remain your wife and live together as we have since we were married. But as much as I would like to say to you that I will never see Carl again, I would only be lying to you. Carl is back in my life, and I don't want to lose him again. This is not the way a marriage is supposed to work, my darling husband. But I cannot help myself for feeling the way I do now. It is my wish that we can somehow come to an arrangement which would permit us to live together as the family we have always been, and to share my dual life. If you can find it within your heart to meet with me, maybe I could better explain my feelings and answer any questions you may have for me. But, my darling husband, I desperately want to remain your loving wife. I love you now and forever, your loving wife. I sat there with the letter in my hand. I now knew more about Carl and Kathy than I had before, about their past relationship. It may have been a lost, unfulfilled teenage romance for Kathy and Carl, but I would not be any part of its fulfillment. Kathy's letter was a true confession, but it changed nothing in my mind. I knew now there could never be full reconciliation between us. She once again told me she needed Carl to be a part of her life. There was no way I could be a part of that arrangement. I put the letter back in the envelope and filed it away for some future date when I would let Jason and Christy read it and understand why their parents divorced. I went silent about reading the letter. Evelyn finally stopped me several days later and asked me if I had read the letter. I wasted time reading that letter, and in short, your sister wanted my permission to remain married to me and still open her legs to her lover. She is not sorry for breaking my heart and my family, she just wants me to roll over and accept her cheating. So, it changes nothing. Whatever Kathy and I had for 16 years is now over. I do not care to meet with her or ever see her again. The divorce will be finalized next week. I turned and walked away from a very sad, soon-to-be sister-in-law. The divorce decree was finalized without me being in attendance. I had my attorney attend the hearing when the decree was made official. I was told Kathy was there and cried as the judge issued the pronouncement. I had my wish. I was never forced to come face to face with Kathy. Whenever necessary, I would inform her of my plans with the children through her sister. The instructions would simply be for her to remain away from us and not try to interfere with them. In fact, she no longer existed in my world. I really wanted to catch hold of the a-hole who ruined my marriage. I really wanted to punch him in the face and kick him in the balls, but I had kids to take care of. I never wanted Kathy to try and take the kids away. So, I decided to take my anger and channel it into creating a better life for my kids. Six months after the divorce, Kathy and Carl married. Over the next two years, Kathy gave birth to a baby boy. They remained living in Gilmore. Kathy's close relationship with Jason and Christy continued over the years. Christy was especially thrilled when her mother gave birth to her new stepbrother. I never met with Kathy or her family after the divorce. In my mind, she died the day I made my fateful discovery. I remained a stern and loving father who became totally involved with the children as they grew up. I refused to go on any dates with the numerous females who constantly tried to become involved with me. Kathy was the only woman I would ever love enough to want to be intimate with in place of sex and female companionship. I focused my attention on the children, my job, and I even became involved in local politics. It was at their 18th birthday that my kids were given the letter that their mother had written to me. I told them that I held on to the letter until I thought they were old enough to understand why I divorced their mother. They understood and supported me. That did cause them to start distancing themselves from their mother and her family. I guess after all these years, I will get some sort of satisfaction. Love may be a many-splendid thing, 
but love can also be a very destructive force when Cupid decides to play his practical jokes. So it was for Kathy and me. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.